So today is our last lecture on reacting mixtures and combustion. Um, we covered how to balance the reaction equation, stoichiometric coefficients. We talked about conservation of energy, the lot of new information with enthalpy of formation and uh, the uh, enthalpy of combustion. Uh, let's talk about the adiabatic flame temperature, absolute entropy, and the third law of thermodynamics. So adiabatic flame temperature. So if you have a control volume and you bring in fuel and you bring in air or a source of oxygen, it could be pure oxygen if you had a source of, you know, a hook up to a bottle of pure oxygen. And in this control volume, it was combustion and outcoming are the products of combustion. Now, if you have some heat removal, then it will reduce the temperature or come at the expense of lowering the temperature of the combustion products. But if it's adiabatic, there's no heat transfer. That means the combustion products are going to come out very high temperature. And for this type of problem, there's no work to t extract any energy out of the system either or any power. So these products come out at an adiabatic flame temperature. It's the highest temperature. We'll call it the temperature adiabatic flame or some other uh, notation for that temperature. And how would we calculate that adiabatic flame temperature? Go back and write the first law for control volume. Say it's adiabatic. There's no work. We have this term. I forgot the name of that term. What is that term? That's right, standard enthalpy of combustion. Okay. And then we have the sum over all the products of the difference in the molar enthalpy coming out at that adiabatic flame temperature minus the 298, the reference enthalpy. That's what that change in enthalpy is. And then we multiply by the stoichiometric coefficient, sum over all the products. Now, when we talk about the adiabatic flame temperature, the air doesn't come in hot or cold, and the fuel doesn't come in hot or cold. So this summation over all the reactants is zero as well. So what we have is an equation zero is equal to the standard enthalpy of combustion plus the sum over all the products, stoichiometric coefficient, and the deviation. So what is, this is the unknown typically. We have to compute the adiabatic flame temperature for some fuel burning with something that generates the products. Now, a big deal with the products is, is whether or not we have, we're going to have carbon dioxide if you're burning a hydrocarbon fuel. You're going to have water. The water is not going to come out liquid at the adiabatic flame temp, high temperature. It's going to go out vapor. So no, don't worry about the liquid water, okay? It's all gaseous. But the question is, is whether or not you're getting oxygen from air. If you do, you're getting a lot of nitrogen out. At nitrogen, if it's coming out, it's coming out at the same temperature as the CO2 and the H2O. It's coming out at that adiabatic flame temperature. It came in cool, 298. Now it's going out at a very high temperature. Hence, it takes a lot of energy. It reduces the flame temperature if you're getting the oxygen from air because there's a lot of nitrogen that goes along for the ride and is heated up. Okay? But this is the energy equation that you would use to calculate the adiabatic flame temperature. All right, so the first question for today. If the percent theoretical air is increased, so let's say it's 100%, then you increase it to 150% or 200%, okay? If the percent theoretical air is increased, how does the standard enthalpy of combustion change? Standard enthalpy of combustion. Is that H bar naught R to P? Is that what they're asking me? Oh, okay, so does this term, does it increase? 
not change or will it decrease? What will it do? If you change the percent theoretical error by increasing it, how does the standard enthalpy of the combustion change? Oh, as a reminder, here's the definition. There's our definition, isn't it? Is everybody in? I should fix my little, like this doesn't need an S there, does it? <laughs> Sorry, will decreases. <laughs> All right. So what does it do? Let's stop it and see what the results are. Stop. And we show the results. Okay. Well, we're split all over the place. Well, um, let's do this. Um, let me draw out for a, a, a generic fuel. Uh, let's do a hydrocarbon fuel. C, uh, let's pick one easy. CH4, methane. And we're going to bring in oxygen and 3.76 nitrogen. And it goes to uh, CO2, one of them. And it goes to two H2Os. And we're going to do it for uh, theoretical air. So at first, we're going to have no oxygen left over. But we're going to have uh, 3.76 nitrogens. But let's balance the oxygen to come back over here. And so what is the oxygen? We have one, two, three, four. So I need two right there. And so we have two right there. Is that true? And then we're going to do this. We're going to put in some factor, one plus some excess. Uh, I forget what the symbol used in this book for excess air. One plus phi. So phi is... 50%, then it would be 150%. I don't know. Does the book use fee for excess air? I don't know. It, but it makes sense, right? So then you come over here, and now we have some oxygen. So we'll have phi times 2. True? And we'll have, whoops, I'm having trouble today. And we'll have 1 plus phi times 2 times 3.76. So you see phi would be some uh, excess air. Maybe it's 25%, 50%, 100%. True? Is this balanced or not? Give me a thumbs up if you like it. A couple more? Is it balanced? Good. Okay, so let's apply this equation to calculate the standard enthalpy of combustion. So we would sum over the products. So... The, the, let me try and write it up here. I know it's getting a little backwards, but we'd have a stoichiometric coefficient, 1 times the enthalpy of formation of CO2, plus stoichiometric coefficient 2 times the enthalpy formation. I should put all the symbols on there. Standard enthalpy formation of H2O. And again, we're just considering gas. Don't worry about liquid. All right, and then we'll have... 2 times phi times the enthalpy formation of O2. Can you remember what is the enthalpy formation of oxygen? Zero. That's a key that's needed. That's needed for this problem. Okay, so guess what? That's all zero. Guess what the other remaining term of uh, 1 plus phi times 2 times 3.76. I'm going to run out of room here. Enthalpy formation of nitrogen. What's enthalpy formation of nitrogen? Zero. All right, so when we come over to the reactants, let's just skip the oxygen and the nitrogen because they have the same enthalpy formation, true? And so the answer of uh, HRP bar not, the standard enthalpy of combustion is dependent on CO2, H2O, minus one times the enthalpy formation of the fuel, whatever the fuel is. If it was methane, great. Okay? So, um, as I increase the percent theoretical error, as phi goes up, 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 does the standard, no, it doesn't, it doesn't affect it. 
I know there's a few steps in there conceptually, but the standard enthalpy formation, it depends on the fuel, how many carbon dioxides you're going to produce, and how many waters you're going to produce for our hydrocarbon fuel. That's it. Okay, for complete combustion, we're going to talk complete combustion on the enthalpy of formation. All right, so what was the right answer for this one? B? I know that was a tough question, wasn't it? You want an easier question? Good luck. <laughs> oh, come on, maybe this one's easier. If the percent theoretical error is increased, how does the adiabatic flame temperature change? Now, here I went and I, I rewrote the uh, first law to help guide you in your thought process. The first law where I left over here, Q dot over N dot, that needs to be zero. That should be zero, okay? Is equal to the standard enthalpy of combustion for whatever the fuel is plus the sum over all the products, stoichiometric coefficient of the product, and that molar enthalpy at the exiting adiabatic flame temperature minus the molar enthalpy of the 298 standard. I, I, I left off the sum over all the reactants because adiabatic flame temperature is computed and reported for 25 degrees C fuel and source of oxygen. So that's all zero there. So if, you, if the percent theoretical error is increased, how does that per adiabatic flame temperature change? Will it increase? Does it remain unchanged? Or will it decrease? We'll go ahead and start now. OK, I just started it. So how will that adiabatic flame temperature change? Everybody in? Everybody in? All right, let's go ahead and turn it off and change, show the results. Does not change, okay. Hmm, if you have more air coming in, what do you have more of? Do you have more nitrogen going in? That means you have more nitrogen going out. So the balance, the stoichiometric coefficient, N for the nitrogen is going to go up, up, up as the percent air, theoretical air, goes up, 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 right? More nitrogen is going to have to be heated. Where are you getting the energy from? From rearranging the fuel into carbon dioxide and water. The fuel doesn't rearrange into anything with nitrogen, true? So it's like this is the enthalpy of combustion for that fuel, and it goes into, not this, that's adiabatic, it's zero, heating up the products. You have more products to heat up, tag along nitrogen, right? The temperature, adiabatic flame temperature, will The adiabatic flame temperature will be lower. It will decrease. Did that help? Hey, this was supposed to be an easier question. <laughs> it wasn't. No? All right, let me, uh, anybody have a comment or question on that? Does it now make sense? A little bit? Okay, let's uh, get rid of the results. Let me ask you this. Will the temperature adiabatic flame, uh, how will it compare for uh, if I'm using pure O2 versus the temperature adiabatic flame 
if I'm getting the O2 from air, standard air, okay? Will it be greater, equal, or less? I have one fuel, let's just burn methane. And I'm saying I'm gonna burn methane with pure oxygen or I'm gonna burn methane where I'm getting the oxygen from air, okay? Which one will give me a higher adiabatic flame temperature? Will it, the pure oxygen, answer A, will be higher, the same, B, or the adiabatic flame temperature for pure oxygen is less than the adiabatic flame temperature uh, combusting air. I just turned it on now, so go ahead and report. Everybody in? Ready to stop? All right, just stop and show the results. And the adiabatic flame temperature when you get pure oxygen, what about pure oxygen? There is no nitrogen that has to be heated up. So all, all of the energy released by the combustion of that fuel will just go into heating up the CO2 and H2O products. There's no N2 in the products. So the best answer was true, A. That makes sense? All right. Now, I was going to solve this problem, but I didn't make it through my 9 o'clock lecture. So what I did was I already reported uh, the solution to this problem this morning. And it's up there. You can look at it. Also, you can take a look at uh, from a year ago how I solved it using Excel. And so you can look at... Uh, not exactly the same percent theoretical error, but another problem. And uh, I encourage you to look at both of these videos, 10 minutes and 17 minutes. And, and in the interest of time, I want to get to another solution that will take me some time to develop. But whenever we compute these adiabatic flame temperatures using the tools in our textbook and tables and appendices, and then we say, great, I'm equipped, I can now go out and understand things like cutting torches and other things. So I look out and I say, oh, here's propane and I'm using air as my source of oxygen. And out there in the literature, there's a reported experimentally measured adiabatic flame temperature in degree C. And I, I look at my value that I computed f uh, using 100% theoretical air and I find out it's not uh, 19.8 but it's 2121 degrees C. Uh, my theoretical computation is higher. Why are they not closer? Well, the predicted adiabatic flame temperature is higher than the experimental measurements that are reported out there in the literature because often to get complete combustion, you have to have a little excess air. And we're assuming perfect amount of air and complete combustion. That's rare. Okay, you usually need a little excess air to help get all the banging that goes on in combustion and get the fuel to bang into some oxygen and split up and break those hydrocarbon bonds. Often, uh, we have that slight excess air. Also, whenever you see a flame coming out, can you visually see the flame? What color might it be? Maybe red? or not red, blue or orange, what you're seeing is photons coming off in the visible region. That's a lot of energy, radiative energy coming off. That's going to lower the adiabatic flame temperature. So even though you say it's adiabatic, <laughs> there is some heat loss because of radiation, and you can visibly see it. And sometimes it's, if it's very high, that nitrogen just doesn't float and say, stay nitrogen. It likes to maybe start to react and it becomes nitrous oxides. Or you don't get all CO2 out, maybe you get some CO with the CO2, and maybe it travels a little further and then finally combusts completely. So um, there's some disassociation or incomplete combustion going on. All those would tend to lower it. Now let's talk about entropy balance, second law for reacting systems. One will only consider steady state, so there's no accumulation or depletion. Let's take a look at this entropy balance. What, do you understand this? 
entropy transfer with heat transfer. So if I have a system and I have some heat transfer, I need to know the temperature of the boundary of the system at which the heat is being transferred into the system to calculate the entropy transfer with that heat. We also have flow, molar flow rate of the reactants, and S-bar. What is that? Some molar entropy. It's going to take a lot of work to calculate that property, but it's just the property entropy on a molar basis for each of those reactants. Likewise, going out each of the products. And then what's this term? Sigma dot. It's the generation of entropy due to irreversibilities. Mixing is a source of irreversibility, especially when you have combustion. All right. Now, to do a good job, just like we had to do a good job with the energy balance, we had to go back and get a common energy datum point, the beginning to measure energy, and that we introduced the enthalpy of formation. Well, for entropy, what they do is they say, Let's go find these entropies, and we'll put them all on an absolute scale. Next slide will explain it. But for each of these S-bars, for subscript I, meaning uh, you could have S-bar for CO2, S-bar for H2O, S-bar for nitrogen. Okay, That's the molar uh, entropy for each component I. It's going to be a function of both temperature and pressure. It's, it's ideal gases, ideal gas mixtures. The CO2 coming out behaves as an ideal gas. The nitrogen coming out, the, uh, the water vapor coming out, all behaves as an ideal gas. So this equation should look familiar. You have this function of temperature only. And you have R bar, natural log of this ratio of P's. This YIP is the partial pressure in the products or the partial pressure in the reactants, depending if you need it for the reactants or if you need it for the products. Okay. And uh, P ref, what do you think that is? The reference pressure. What do you think the reference pressure is? 1 ATM. Okay. So a lot of times our reactants come in 1 ATM, products go out 1 ATM and those will cancel. And you'll just be left with the natural log of YI. But if the products come in, or the products go out at a different pressure than the reference pressure of 1 ATM, then you have to deal with that, OK? OK, but often, often this is true. Not always, but often. Uh, R bar, natural gas constant. True? OK. So now we introduce this uh, absolute entropy and in introduce the third law of thermodynamics. Why do we need a third law? Take a graduate class in thermodynamics. There's my short answer, OK? I don't have a lot of time. Is, does it feel like we're going fast this semester? Does it feel like we should cover more information and more depth? Usually students complain, and too much information, too much depth. but. Uh, there was a zeroth law that had to do with thermal equilibrium and temperatures of three objects. First law, conservation of energy. Second law, basically quality of energy or measure of disorder of systems or accounting for irreversibilities of processes. There's a couple ways to describe this second law, but we use it in the notion of uh, irreversibilities and in the property entropy, okay, entropy balance. Now we have this, what, third law? We need another law? What it says is the third law says that an, uh, you can define the absolute entropy of a pure crystalline substance to be zero at an absolute temperature of zero. Um, can any substance ever get to an absolute temperature of zero? No, but you can get closer and closer and closer. So it's like a limit in the, in the limit. Also, this word crystalline structure, substance, you've taken a materials class. What does that mean to you? Order on a molecular level. 
So if I'm a molecule and I want to know where my neighbors are, I'd say, well, straight north, straight east, straight west, or whatever the structure is, but it's a crystalline structure, right? Versus an amorphous. What's that mean? You really don't know. It's all jumbled up. So if you're a molecule, molecular level, and you're in an amorphous uh, substance or structure, you say, where's my neighbors? I don't know. They're somewhere around me, but I don't know which direction to go to find them. Okay? So this is the idea is that you're getting rid of any and all uncertainty because if between molecules and their uh, positions, because if you're at zero Kelvin, how much are you wiggling if you're a molecule? You ain't moving. You're stuck. And so you're stuck where everybody knows where you're at in a crystalline. So theoretically, they figured out how to tie everything together with absolute entropy, and that's the datum point. Can you ever get there? No. But they can somehow reference everything back to that case. So, so in a pure, perfect, crystalline structure at absolute Kelvin zero, the absolute entropy is given to be zero, and you move up from there. It is impossible to get there, but theoretically, there you go. Let's take a look at this table A25. Forget Gibbs function for now. We understand enthalpy of formation, molar mass, formula, substance, heating values, higher and lower, but now we finally understand this absolute entropy. So somebody says the substance is at 298 Kelvin, 25 degrees C, and 1 atm. That's the absolute entropy of that substance. Let's take a look. First line, carbon. Is that magnitude high or low compared to the other values in the table? It's the lowest of the low. But what does that little s mean on the carbon? Solid state. Uh, after solid comes L. Let's take a look at the L. So it goes from about 6 for this carbon at the same temperature and pressure versus water in the liquid state, same pressure and temperature. And now we're about 70, 6 to 7. It went up. But then look at all the Gs. <coughs> They're all over 100, aren't they? They're close to 200 or even more. So what does this tell you? That it still has the same trend for this entropy, the absolute entropy of a solid's lower than a liquid, and the gas is the highest. Think about measure, entropy measuring molecular disorder. <coughs> so that's how you get this S bar. What's the bar mean on the S? Motor. What's that not mean? Standard temperature pressure, standard temperature pressure. If you're bringing in an ideal gas mixture, some carbon dioxide gas, some oxygen gas, some nitrogen gas, or taking it out, you're going to have to deal with that, that this is not the only term. You have to have this S bar not as a function of temperature. If it's any temperature above 298, go to the next table. Minus R natural log of YIP over P ref. If it's in a mixture, you have to account for its mole fraction and the pressure of the mixture compared to 1 ATM reference. All right. What's the next table? Well, the next table we need to become familiar with is A23. So A23, as a reminder, you have the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, water, vapor, and oxygen. And a lot of the data, some of the data is repeated, so these tables tie together. They mesh together. So let's take a look, first of all, enthalpy of formation. Take a look at the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide. This number, negative 393520. It's right here in the table. See that? They repeat that in the header. Oh, we're going to remind you that carbon dioxide has an enthalpy of formation, and they repeat it. Similarly for water in the vapor state, water vapor, there's the same number for the enthalpy of formation. True? That's good, reassuring. Now let's take a look at H bar, U bar, S bar naught. So S bar naught at 298 for carbon dioxide, this number, is that repeated? 
out of table A25? Sure enough, right there it is. Those are the same values. So if you want S bar naught at a temperature other than 298, you have to go to table A23. Okay. And don't forget that other part if it's a mixture. If it's pure stream of carbon dioxide, then you just have to worry about the pressure compared to AT pressure compared to one ATM. Okay. Uh, this value for water is repeated right here. And this value for oxygen is repeated for oxygen right there. Okay? All right. It's going to take us a while to solve this problem, but let's get started. I'm not going to be able to fit it on one page, so bear with me. A stream, not a steam. Uh, for, can't spell today. A stream of liquid ethanol and a second stream of 125% theoretical air enters a combustor. So here's my combustor, there's my fuel stream, there's my air stream, and they enter into the combustor. Both streams are 298 and 1 ATM. That means the fuel is at 1 ATM in a separate stream, pure fuel. And then the next one is pure air, which is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen at 1 ATM. Okay. Combustion products leave at 500 Kelvin and the same pressure, 1 ATM. So in 298, 1 ATM, out 500 Kelvin, 1 ATM. Heat transfer from the reactor takes place as an average temperature of 450 Kelvin. What they're saying is, is this boundary temperature, if you need to calculate any entropy transfer, use an average boundary temperature of 450 Kelvin if you need to calculate entropy transfer with that heat. Determine the rate of entropy generation within the reactor in units of kilojoule per Kelvin per kilomole of fuel. So struggle with what, what are we asked to calculate? What symbol? And do I know the units? I'm asked to calculate sigma dot divided by n dot of the fuel. True? OK. How about the part B? Rate of exergy destruction within the reactor. Ooh, it's been a long time since I've seen exergy. Yeah, well, E dot D, rate of exergy destruction per n dot f. True? You know what? If I got the answer from part A, sigma dot over n dot f, I think I could make the leap to part B. How would I do it? By the dead state temperature, absolute T naught, and T naught here they tell you is 298 Kelvin. So really it's the same problem. I just need to get sigma dot over n dot. All right, so I take a look at the second law. If I write out the second law, I'm going to have sigma dot over n dot of the fuel is equal to minus q dot over n dot of the fuel divided by Tb plus the sum over all the products n s bar minus the sum over all the reactants n s bar. I took my general second law equation, manipulated it just a little bit, and I wrote it like that. Does that look okay? Can you see that? All right. So I'm going to have to get my stoichiometric coefficients at the least from my balanced reaction equation from all the reactants and all the products. I'll have to get these S bars uh, for all the reactants, all the products, and I'll have to know what this Q dot over N dot F is. I'll have to know the heat transfer because I know the boundary temperature, 450. So, hmm, there's a lot of work that goes into this. But let's go ahead and write our balanced reaction equation for this problem. So, C2H5OH is the fuel. We're going to bring in so much oxygen with 
the right amount of nitrogen mixed with it because it's coming from air. And right away I can balance the carbon to get two carbon dioxides. Right away I can balance the water, the hydrogen, H2Os, so the hydrogens mean that there's three H2Os. And then at this point I'll go back and I'll balance the oxygen for stoichiometric. When I come back and balance the oxygen for stoichiometric, it's three O2s. True or false? Good, I got one thumbs up. Do the oxygen for me and verify that that's right. When you got it, give me a thumbs up. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, we're good. Twelve, perfect. Happy dozen. Now, if I come over here, I'm going to have three times 3.76 N2s. True? It's now completely balanced for 100% theoretical error. I'm now, in the interest of space, I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm just going to modify that equation because I'm going to have 125%. So I'll put a 1.25 right there, leaving at 0.25 times 3. O2s plus 1.25 times 3 times 3.76 N2s. True or false? True. Good. Very good. Now, because I've solved a number of these problems before, <laughs> you learn there's certain strategies to avoid errors and to make it a little easier for you. What I did was I would rewrite this equation again and I would say, exactly how many O2s are there? Well, there's 3.75 O2s. And exactly how many N2s are there? 14.1 N2s. It's really just saying, if when I need the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the nitrogen coming in with the reactants, it's 14.1. And then I'll have two CO2s, three H2Os, and for the oxygen, going out 0 0.7502s and 14.1 N2s. Notice the same number of nitrogens come in and out, but not the same number of oxygen. True? That's kind of obvious, but just be aware that, that it or not. Now we write the energy balance equation, the first law to find Q dot divided by n dot f. Okay, well that's going to be h of r p bar naught, standard enthalpy of combustion for that fuel, plus the sum over all of the products, stoichiometric coefficient, times the delta h bar, which is h bar at the temperature that the products are going out at. The temperature that the products are going out at is 500 Kelvin, true? Minus the H bar at 298. So I need that sum over all the products. Minus the sum over all the reactants, N times H bar. But what are the, all the reactants coming in at? 298. What's the reference? 298. So guess what the sum over all the reactants is? Zero. That makes sense? Because the delta H bar is zero. Okay? So how do I find uh, HRP bar not for liquid ethanol? There's one of two strategies. Both strategies will work. How would you find it? You're in a test. <laughs> You don't have a lot of time. I need this H bar not RP for liquid ethanol. I'm sorry? It's not going to depend on the percent theoretical error at all. You can use one of the heating values and the molar mass of the ethanol. So you say, okay, this is... Uh, 
I know I need a negative on some heating value. Is it lower or higher heating value? I'll have to figure that out in a minute. And then do I multiply by the molar mass of the fuel or divide by the molar mass? I'll have to figure that out. But I remember some relation like this. How is the water going out of here? At 500 Kelvin, water's going out vapor. That tells me what type of heating value to use. Lower heating value, right? Then do I multiply or divide by the molar mass? Look at the units, you multiply by the molar mass. True? So I can get this value of H, uh, enthalpy combustion, and it, it'll compute to negative 1,234,676 kilojoules per kilomole. Don't forget the negative sign. Okay. How else can you do it? You say, hey, uh, I'm going to go back and sum over all the products, stoichiometric coefficient, enthalpy formation, minus the sum, stoichiometric coefficient, uh, enthalpy formation over all the reactants. True? You do it for this, you'll get one, negative 1,234,876 1, kilojoules per kilomole. The lower heating value is only good to four significant digits. That's all they give you in the tables. So don't try to say, hey, why is there a difference out here on digit, you know, six, seven, and eight? <laughs> or whatever that is, five, six, and seven. Right? These are the same numbers. Engineer says, same number. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, get all, which one, doesn't matter which one you're going to use. You understand there's two ways to get it? Both of them will work. All right. So then I expand out this equation. So I'll have this HRP bar naught plus the sum over all the products, stoichiometric coefficient. So I'll have the number of moles of CO2 times the en molar enthalpy of CO2 at 500 minus the molar enthalpy at 298. All of that is CO2. And then I'll have another term, stoichiometric coefficient, enthalpy at 500 minus enthalpy 298. All of that for the water vapor, H2O, G. And I also have some oxygen. I'm running out of room, so I have to scoot down. Stoichiometric coefficient, H bar 500 minus H bar 298. All of that for oxygen and stoichiometric coefficient, H bar 500 minus H bar 298. All of that at nitrogen. Spelled out a little better? So this is Q dot over N dot F, true? Edit, copy. Let's go to the next page. And I didn't leave enough room in there, but I'll try and paste it in anyway. Edit, paste. And I'll put it right down here, maybe. And so what I have to do is go to table A23, right here. And in my carbon dioxide, I have to grab the H bar at 298 and the H bar at 500 Kelvin. Then I have to get for the water, H bar at 298, H bar at 500 Kelvin. For the oxygen, H bar, H bar, nitrogen, H bar, H bar. Get those eight values and stick them in to this equation right here, okay? And I compute that Q dot over N dot F is negative one comma, one oh nine comma, four eight five kilojoules per kilomole. What's the negative sign mean? that it's out of the control volume. Even though the products are coming out hot at 500, <laughs> if it was insulated, they'd come out hotter. But there is some heat transfer out of that control volume, okay? If there's heat transfer out of the control volume, there's entropy transfer out of the control volume, true? So let's go back to our entropy balance equation right here. We just computed this number, 
we have all our stoichiometric coefficients, okay? This one, I really should expand it out. Let me go to a new page. Insert a new page. What I need to do is I need to expand out that the rate of entropy production per rate of fuel flowing in, we have the Q dot over N dot F divided by TB. And now we have the sum over all the products. Well, put the stoichiometric coefficient times the, each of those products. But this is going to be um, N times S bar, okay? The sum over all the products. Uh, that's not an N dot, it's just an N. So let me expand this like this. This is going to be for the carbon dioxide, S bar for the water, N S bar for the oxygen, N S bar for the nitrogen. Then we have the sum over all of the reactants, N S bar of the fuel minus N S bar of our oxygen coming in with the reactants. This oxygen is with the products. N S bar of my nitrogen with the reactants. This nitrogen is with the products. Okay. So um, these are the fuel is coming in at 298. So this one's straight out of that table for the fuel. Yes. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. It's amazing I don't make mere, more errors trying to rush. But uh, where is my ethanol liquid? 160.70. Where does that go? Right there. All right. What about the oxygen? Well, it's going to be S bar not at 298 minus R bar natural log of the mole fraction of oxygen in the reactants. Well, the mole fraction is 21%, and you're going to have the mole fraction of nitrogen in the reactants. That's 79%. Despite my best intentions, I still have fallen short in being able to finish this problem. Should we pick it up on Wednesday or should we just heave it overboard? Oh, I got to go. Uh, you guys got to go. Test it too. See you later. <laughs>